We had an amazing uh, New Year's Eve prayer time. I, I don't know how many, well, we had, the place was almost full, but it was, it was really incredible as we began to intercede. It actually, I got to apologize, we did go a little beyond the hour, uh, and it was a good going on beyond the hour, the presence of God here. We were just interceding for ourselves and for the 2020. And I, I have a, a really strong expectation for what God wants to do uh, in Encounter Church this year. Uh, I mean, there's some things about growth, about reaching the lost, about uh, making a higher level of an impact in our community. Uh, we've reached out to the city of Centennial. We've had some initial meetings with them about how we can partner with them and do some things. Eliphaz and I are going to be attending some, some upcoming sort of city planning things and, uh, you know, kind of really low level at this point. But, but I just know that this is the beginning uh, of what God has, has spoken over our church and, and over our lives to have a greater influence for the kingdom of God in our generation. We don't want to just sit around and complain about the world going to hell in a handbasket. We want to be doing something to stop it from going to hell in a handbasket. Amen. It's an enthusiasm. This is a good thing. And a part of that is recognizing that every single one of us who is a follower of Jesus Christ it, it has a role to play in bringing the kingdom of God into our present generation. To, to, from praying, to sharing, to serving, to giving, to, 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 to sacrificing our lives for others. I mean, th there is a part we have to play. And I am just so excited that as we were reading the prayer request, which we'll be praying over uh, as a pastoral team going into the next few weeks, uh, as we're praying for those, I see that many of you are extending your faith and you're believing for God to do big things in you and through you in 2020. Well, I just want to say, don't stop. Don't stop. Keep putting out an expectation that God is going to pour out into you a greater anointing for spiritual growth, a greater anointing for better health. I mean, I, I, I want, I'm going to be healthier this year than I was last year. I told Sarah to stop buying the Costco Dorito chip things. I mean... <laughs> There, there's stuff in them. I mean, they're addictive. They're horrible. Anyway, it's, it's, I mean, I want to be physically, but, but financially, I believe that God wants to retire a million dollars plus in debt in this congregation this year. He wants us to be able to pay down our credit cards, to, to pay off our student loans, to, to see us to be able to step into some places of, of financial prosperity, to buy houses. God wants to bring promotions and raises. He wants to help us win people to the Lord. God does not want us just to keep going, oh, my neighbor, they're unsaved and they live such unrighteous lifestyles. No, God wants us to be involved in our neighbor's life saying, man, I know a way that may not seem rational to a lot of people, but I'm going to introduce you to a savior that will change your life. So I hope we have big expectations because I believe that our Abba Father wants to equip us this year to experience the joy of his unconditional love. The joy of his unconditional love. The blessings of his unchangeable promises. His promises don't change. If he promised it to the people in the first century, it's a promise you can bank on. If he said he'd seek first the kingdom of God and all these things would be added unto you, you can seek first the kingdom of God and all these things will be added unto you. He said, if you would cry out unto the Lord to be saved, you will be saved. If he said, these signs will follow those who believe in my name. These signs will follow those who believe in his name. They're unchangeable promises. And he wants us to know the power of his in incomparable spirit. There's lots of people talking spiritual stuff right now. We're a highly spiritual generation. And, and that's good and bad, in my opinion. What's good about it is, is it opens ourselves up to believe in the supernatural to know that, that what we can see, feel, taste, and touch is not the extent of reality, that reality goes beyond the physical realm into the spiritual realm. And God wants us to know that. And he wants us to know that his incomparable, incomparable spirit brings a supernatural anointing into our lives. That's what I'm believing for. I want you to believe for big things in 2020. But I have a question. And this is just for you and God to kind of chew on. Is how you're living today going to produce the results you want tomorrow? Is how you're living today going to produce the results you want tomorrow? And that's, that's a question that takes a little while to answer. And there's a number of legitimate responses. You could say, absolutely, I know I'm on track. I know I've got my goals. I know what I'm doing. God's given me a plan. That's a, that's a hard yes. 
And there's some of us, we go, eh, it's a hard no. <laughs> I know what I'm doing is not going to produce what I want to see in my life this year. But there's a lot of folks in between that are the I hope so's and the maybes. But this morning, I want to help us all to realize that God is not trying to hide his will from us. He doesn't want us frustrated and just, you know, figuring things out on our own. He wants to partner with us so that we can know what his will is. What is it he wants us to achieve in 2020? And he wants us to know how to achieve it. And to know if what we're doing is going to bring about what we're hoping to see happen. Make sense? Well, the first thing we got to do is we can't be obtuse or unbelieving. Obtuse or unbelieving. Well, what do I mean? I, I occasionally meet strangers, and being me, I, I, start, I talk to strangers. I, I do. I love talking to strangers because, you know, I've never met a stranger. And as I, as I talk to them, I, I usually ask them, hey, how can I pray for you? And, you know, usually they'll tell me something, but often I'll get this response, everything's good, everything's fine, I don't need prayer. Which tells me one of three things. It tells me either they really don't want to share their personal private (laughs) stuff with me, a stranger they met in a coffee shop. Can't imagine why anybody wouldn't want to share their personal private stuff (laughs) with a stranger they just kind of ran into. I don't know why that is. But but other people, it's because they're not aware of the dysfunction in their life. They're obtuse. And I don't want us to be obtuse. I mean, God, it says in Romans 12, his chastisement comes upon us, not to to cause pain, but to help us to grow. God wants to reveal the things in us that that are just not working. But neither does he want us to be unbelieving. Because there are some people who say that because they don't believe God can change their lives. They don't believe in God, or they don't believe in prayer, or they've lost hope that, that, that something can come into their lives and make a difference. And I don't want us to be obtuse or unbelieving, because if we are, we will shut down the voice of God, and he wants to reveal to us what we should be expecting and how we should be expecting it. It's good stuff. You know, one of my favorite passages in the Bible is this. It's Romans 12, verses 1 through 2, and it says, And so, dear brothers and sisters... In fact, can, can, let's just read this together. Look at the big screens, if you would, on, the, on my left and right. On the count of three. One, two, three. And so, dear brothers and sisters, I plead with you to give your bodies to God because of all he has done for you. Let them be a living and holy sacrifice, the kind he will find acceptable. This is truly the way to worship him. Don't copy the behavior and customs of this world. But let God transform you into a new person by changing the way you think. Then you will learn to know God's will for you, which is good and pleasing and perfect. There is so much in that two passage, two sentence passage. Incredible. I, 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 could, I could ramble for weeks about revelation that just cries out from that passage. But what I want us to see is, is that God transforms us. God causes us to experience his his abundance, his blessing, his joy, his power, because he's able to transform us by altering what we think and how we think it. Jesus did not see the world the way you and I see the world. Jesus was one of the most victimized people in the history of the world, but he never saw himself as a victim. He never saw himself as a victim. I'm not a victim. No, no, I chose this. Jesus, how could you look more humble and meek and powerless? Did he have an army? He didn't even have a security force. He didn't even have guys running around with lanyards and radios the way we have in church this morning. He had none of that. But when they arrested him and they brought him before Pilate and they beat him and they scourged him, he said, look, dudes, I'm going willingly. If I wanted to, I'd call 10,000 angels, and you would have a problem. I mean, he he never saw himself as a victim or powerless. He never saw a person in a hopeless situation. Chew on that. Jesus never saw a person whose situation was hopeless, because nothing was impossible for his father. He never saw anybody who was beyond God's grace. He never saw anyone who was beyond God's love. He never saw anyone who had made too many stupid decisions. He saw the world differently. The prophet Isaiah recorded a revelation that he received from the Holy Spirit in Isaiah 58, verses 8, many of 55, verse 8. 
And this is God talking. He says, my thoughts are nothing like your thoughts, says the Lord. And my ways are far beyond anything you could imagine. What God wants you to do in 2020 is experience the fullness of his abundance by changing the way you think to start to see the world, not as you and I see it as natural people, but as he sees it and his son sees it and the spirit sees it and he changes us to see it because then we'll change how we live. And instead of living the way the world lived, which brings about destruction, we will live in a way that causes the will of God to become a reality in our life. And the things that we aspire to and the ambitions that we have and the goals that we write down on prayer cards, they will become a reality. This is a big deal. This renewing your mind. This changing your way of thinking. It's something that I pray that no one who's watching online or is here this morning or watches us on YouTube or Facebook later, I pray that none of you ignore this, but that all of us will embrace an active renewing of our minds now, this January. It's the first Sunday in January because it's something that none of us should put off. It is way easier to start the year out right, on the right path, than it is to reverse course because we've gone astray some months later. I've shared this story before. When I was a younger man, I was an engineer, and I was flying to Orlando for some business meetings in that central Florida area. And I got away from Kansas City late. It was you know, pouring rain when I landed. It was delayed. It was 10 o'clock. And this is pre-cell you know, phones. There weren't like you could Google your hotel. And I was actually staying in a hotel I'd never been at before. I'd been to Flor or Florida many times. But, but I got there, and you know, they, they offer you that map at the car rental you know, place. They give you that map that's so helpful. Aren't those helpful maps? You know, one side is a globe, and the other side, <laughs> you know, and it's, you know, it's a map you can't figure anything out at. But, but I remember I was trying to find this hotel, and it was raining, and I'm looking for the exits. And I thought I knew Orlando, but it didn't because I ended up on the Florida Turnpike, uh, you know, driving. You know, I'm looking at Ensel back there. I was on my way to Miami. And it took me a good 20 miles to realize I was on my way to Miami. And then I had to get off and try to get back on. And it was 2 in the morning by the time I got to my hotel. The point of this is, is metaphorically, you do not want to drive halfway to Miami in 2020. <laughs> you don't want to do that. You don't want to head in the wrong direction. You want to go in the right direction so that you're, you're achieving the goals that the Holy Spirit has put on your heart. So, so let's not delay renewing our minds. Let's get into letting God change how we think now. See, if we start now, the changes that we have to make, and just to be candid, most of us have to make some changes if we want to achieve different results in 2020 than we did in 2019. But the changes we have to make in January are way smaller than the changes you have to make in July. I mean, just from the practical standpoint, I'm a big fan of Dave Ramsey. Anybody familiar with Dave Ramsey? Yeah. I think Dave's amazing. I think everybody ought to go through financial peace. I, I've actually listened to it multiple times. Great personal financial planning. Part of his deal is everybody should have a $1,000 emergency fund, right? Do you know if you start this week, in order to have a $1,000 emergency fund in December at the, at the end of this year, all you've got to put away is 20 bucks a week. 20 bucks a week. You put $20 a week every weekend, end of the year, you'll have 1000 bucks. You wait till July, how much you gotta put away? You gotta weigh 40 bucks. You wait till December, how much you gotta put away per week? 250 per week, okay? It gets harder the longer you wait. Let's not wait, let's do the easy change now that will bring the results that we're believing for in December. In fact, if you delay letting God change how you think, if you delay letting him use that renewed mind to alter your behaviors, it's possible that you won't achieve everything that he has for you in 2020. As a young engineer, when you graduate college and go to work for a design firm, one of the things they drill into you is that the real world is different than college. Amen. Can I get an amen out there? Yeah. And one of the things they really emphasize when you go from the theoretical to the practical is that procrastination works in college to an extent, but it does not work in real life. Now in college, you can put stuff off. I took a modern and relativistic physics class my, my senior year of college. 
I stopped attending classes about the fourth week. Uh, it was incredibly boring. It was in a giant lecture hall. There was a man from Egypt who taught it, and I never understood a thing he said. So I figured I could sleep in my dorm room far easier than attend his class. However, the final was 80% of your grade. So a week before the final, I locked myself in my dorm room with my textbook, some worked homework assignments from other friends, some notes from previous classes, and I taught myself a semester of modern and relativistic physics in a 48-hour no-sleep marathon. I got an 86 on the final. <laughs> got to be in the class. But that doesn't work in the real world. Our, the company, the design firm I worked for, set us down and said, hey, look, let me tell you the truth. We've been studying projects for a long time. And when a project gets three months behind in the design phase, 99 times out of 100, it never catches up. The best you can hope for is to finish three months behind schedule. And we don't make any money being three months behind schedule. So you don't get to procrastinate if we're paying you. We need you to engage from the first day of the project. And that translates into this message in saying that why in the world would you wait till Easter to do what we could do in New Year's? Because there are some things that won't happen if we don't start letting God change how we think. Okay. Let's talk about this verse one more time. I want to review it. So dear brothers and sisters, that's you guys. Look at your neighbors. Say, hello, brother <laughs> or sister. <laughs> All right, whatever. Hello, sister. Hello, brother. I plead with you. <laughs> you don't have to tell them that. All right. I plead with you to give your bodies to God because of all he has done for you. Let them be a living and holy sacrifice, the kind he will find acceptable. But you can't do that unless this next part happens. This is truly the way to worship him. And don't copy the behavior and customs of this world. Got to change our customs and behavior. You can't copy what they're doing. But let God transform you into a new person. Who transforms us? By changing the way you think, and then you will learn to know God's will for you, which is good and pleasing and perfect. How does God change how we think? He alters our thoughts. But, but why are my thoughts such a big deal? Aren't my behaviors a bigger deal? I mean, I can think anything I want, right? The problem is science has proven that there is a connection between your thoughts and your actions. You literally program yourself how to behave by how you think. You think like a victim, you behave like a victim. You think you're powerless, you behave powerless. You think God ignores your prayers, you have no faith. You think people are not trustworthy, evil, horrible humans, you become guarded and defensive. You never form intimate relationships. Your behaviors are based on your thoughts. Dr. Carolyn Leaf, who is a, a neuroscientist, many of you are familiar with her, and she's the author of a number of books, including Turn On Your Brain, said this. She said, if you realized how powerful your thoughts are, you would never think a negative thought. That's a convicting statement. Because I've had some negative thoughts. You know, they're, they're doing a special on CNN uh, on a singer from the 70s called uh, uh, Linda Ronstadt. Anybody remember Linda Ronstadt? Yeah. Well, she, she did a cover of a Warren Zevon song that was, you know, very popular. It was called Poor, Poor, Pitiful Me. <laughs> and I think sometimes as, as, as believers, instead of believing that we're the overcoming children of the Most High God who are beloved in all that we do and that the Lord has good and perfect things for us to step into and that the things that hold us back are only temporary, they're not permanent, and that there's no challenge that's, that's going to overcome us, that we're the head, not the tail, we're reviewing Linda Ronstadt, oh, poor, pitiful me, poor, poor, pitiful me. And we keep renewing that, and that should not be our theme song. Was that a cool cultural reference for people who are at least middle-aged? I'm just curious. <laughs> I know that some of the millennial people may not know Linda Ronstadt, but hey, you know, Google her. She's actually pretty cute and has a great voice. She is, all right? The issue is that, according to Carolyn Leaf and to a lot of neuroscientists, is that thoughts are real physical things that occupy mental real estate. There's a place in your brain where your thoughts reside. Moment by moment, every day, you are changing the structure of your brain through thinking. 
When we hope, it is an activity of the mind that changes the structure of our brain in a positive and normal direction. Take a look at this picture of some neurons and all this. That's basically a road map. And it's a picture of your brain. And when you think certain ways, you, if you think according to the word of God, when people treat you a certain way, and you apply God's grace and God's faith and, and, and a revelation of who you are, well, you connect that input to a certain output, which is to speak faith over your circumstance, to not let people freak you out, to, to, to behave as Christ would behave. But when you think negative thoughts, victimized thoughts, powerless thoughts, weak thoughts, poor, poor, pitiful me thoughts, you connect that input to a different output. And what you're doing is you're strengthening and widening the neural pathway between that input and that output. You're creating certain super highways in your brain, teaching yourself to behave certain ways. And God wants to build different super highways. He doesn't want you to be manipulated through temptations and other things. God wants you to, to, to see food differently. How many of you have ever purchased a big gulp soda? Yeah. How many of you believe big gulps are healthy? <laughs> How many of you believe they are a bargain? Yeah. How can something be unhealthy and a bargain at the same time? It is not a bargain. Did you know that the average size of a Coca-Cola in the 1950s, if you went into a diner and ordered a soda, they gave you a seven ounce bottle? A seven ounce bottle is a taste test. That's not a soda, I want an unlimited supply of whatever it is I've ordered. I want it coming on tap with free refills. I mean, this is, this is what I'm looking for. There is one fast food restaurant that has a one gallon size equivalent of their Big Gulp. Who can drink a gallon of soda? Please don't raise your hands. <laughs> but somewhere in our brain, we look at that and we say, bargain. And so we go in and instead of buying a rational 12 ounce size soda, which might not even be rational in of itself, we go, well, that's 60 cents and this is 70 cents. I don't want the big gulp. Because we see it as a bargain in our brain. And it's not. It's just a way for them to sell more soda. And that's what they do. Don't blame 7-Eleven, okay? Blame yourself. <laughs> You're the one buying it. Take responsibility. We cannot just expect the world to conform. <laughs> I mean, New York City, they're actually banning big gulps, thinking that's going to stop obesity. That's not the problem. The, the, the problem is how we see food. Some people see it as a drug. Some people love to eat when we're depressed. Some people just... Find the endorphin rush. Cool. I mean, have you ever eaten an entire pecan pie? <laughs> it's a beautiful feeling. <laughs> Dr. Lee says this. <laughs> you cannot sit back and wait to be happy and healthy and have a great thought life. You have to make the choice to make this happen. You have to choose to get rid of the toxic and get back in alignment with God. And you can be overwhelmed by every small setback in life or you can be energized with the possibilities they bring. All things work to the good of those who love the Lord and are called according to his purpose. What the enemy intended for evil, God intended for good. These are truths that we can embrace so that we overcome the obstacles in 2020 so that we achieve the success that God wants for us so that we don't just have hopes, we have expectations and we have plans to meet those expectations. How do we get our thoughts in the alignment with God's word? You get are with God's thoughts by reading and applying God's words. But there are some catches. I want to show you a short video from an interview with John Brevere. Many of you know John. And the head of Logos Bible Software. So can we play this? There was a recent study by the Center for Bible Engagement where they pulled 40,000 uh, p- uh, general population in the U.S. from 8 to 80. And... They just wanted to see how we are engaging with Scripture. Right. And they discovered something that actually became kind of the profound discovery of the entire study. It, they weren't even looking for this, and this is kind of became the highlight of the study. Right. Um, when we're in the Scripture one time a week, and that could be church on Sunday. That's pastor saying you open your Bible, we hear the message. One time a week, 
had negligible effect on some key areas of your life. So I'll, I'm going to spell that out more here in a moment. Two times a week, negligible effect. Now at three times a week, there was a blip on the map. Like there was a heartbeat. Something happened, again, a heartbeat. Okay. But here was the profound discovery. When we're in the scripture four times a week, it literally spikes off the chart. You would expect that it'd be one, two, th I mean, there'd be a gradual incline right. on the effect and impact that would have in your life, but it was literally one, two, three, four, something radically happens. Okay, you got my curiosity. To this what, extent. What kind of behavior is being affected? Feeling lonely drops 30%. Wow. Ang four times a week in the four Bible. Four times a week in the Bible. Okay. Anger issues drop 32%. Uh, bitterness in relationships, marriage, a relationship with your kids, and so on, drops 40%. Alcoholism drops 57%. Crazy. Feeling spiritually stagnant. You know, if there was one area when I'm talking with people that, that they'll be honest about is they just feel spiritually stagnant. Ask them the question, how much time are you spending in the scripture? If they're in the scripture four times a week or more, it drops 60%. Wow. Viewing pornography drops 61%. That's very important. Now, on a flip positive side, sharing your faith wow. jumps 200%. Wow. Because you have a confidence in God's word. And then discipling others jumps 230%. That's, that's amazing right there. So guess what I'm going to encourage you to do this year? <laughs> I'm going to encourage you to get into your word at least how many times a week? That kind of sets you up. There, there is this reality that I wish that, you know, okay, at this time of year to get the infomercials where get a six-pack abs in five minutes a week with Ab Blaster 2020. You, you, you know, you can order it online for three easy flex payments. And, and you do this, and suddenly you look like you're ripped and everything. Those don't work. I, I just I can tell you, they don't work. They never have worked. You, you, you can't just work out one day a week and see appreciable transformation in your life. I mean, you, you might be able to hold some things steady at best, but you're not going to be transformed by working out one day a week. I'm, don't laugh. That's just the reality. <laughs> it's, I, if you want to be transformed in your brain, you feed yourself junk 8 to 16 hours a day. Do, 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 do. I mean, I, I, come on. The average person in this room spends 6 to 8 hours a day watching online something between Facebook and all the other stuff if we're a normal church, which I think we are. And so we're not going to overcome all of that input in, in a 30-minute message on a Sunday morning. We, we've got to recognize that to transform our thinking, we really have to spend more time in the Word of God. That's one of the catches. <laughs> the second thing you've got to realize is just reading will not bring the effect we want. Just like in, in physical transformation, you need exercise and nutrition Trust me, I've tried. You can't outwork your diet. You can always eat more than you burn. You, you have to read the Word, and then you have to let the Word read you. Question. When was the last time a scripture made you uncomfortable? You read it and you went, really? Uh-oh. Just a question. When was the last time something you read challenged something you believed? When was the last time a scripture reminded you of a truth you had forgotten? I read this morning Acts 3 that was gate beautiful. And, uh, you know, Aaron said, hey, I really think we're supposed to pray for all these people with crutches and all those folks we'd seen. And, and I thought that would be cool. And I thought God reminded me of that Acts 3 gate beautiful. And there's a verse in there where after, you know, this guy gets healed, Peter said, do you think it's by my power or my godliness that any of this happened? It was by faith in the name of Jesus Christ. So my prayer while we were praying was that I want to see faith built up in people. I want to see people's faith. It doesn't matter who's laying hands on you. It matters if we develop a culture of faith around here because that's what's going to release the supernatural. Broken people can do miraculous things. Isn't that a good thing? We just, we got to realize the scriptures have to change how we think. We look at ourselves and say, I'm messed up. I do this stuff. I keep having this struggle. And we think it disqualifies ourselves. And it never qualified us in the beginning. We got to renew our minds 
and let the scriptures challenge us, convict us, transform what we believe. And so I want to encourage you that whatever time you spend reading, that you spend an equal amount of time thinking about it. If you read five minutes of verses a day, spend five minutes thinking about that verse, how it applies to your life. Spend 30 minutes reading the scriptures, spend 30 minutes thinking about how it applies to your life. And I want to encourage you to do something else. One of the challenges with exercise is that when you discover a routine you like, you tend to keep doing that. You know, if you've got a certain number of weight machines you like to do when you go through, if there's a certain treadmill you like or a certain elliptical you like or whatever it is you do for exercise, walking, pickleball, whatever flips, you keep doing that. And what happens is you keep doing the same exercise. It'll keep you at a certain level, but its ability to transform you goes down. Your bodies adapt. You, you physically adapt to it. And your mind is the same way. If you have been doing the same Bible reading program for year after year after year after year, I hate to break this to you, but the odds are it has become less effective every year that you have repeated that pattern. Now, I read, used the same Bible reading program for like 15 years. And as I was thinking about this, I realized that there were some plateaus in my life that probably are directly attributable to the fact that I did not vary my Bible reading program. And I kept it because it was easy and it was simple and I could follow through with it. And I would read it and I would tick the box. Well, you live in the 21st century. You have free Bible reading apps that are available. You have an innumerable number of ministries, including Marilyn Hickey Ministries. I think we actually have Bible plans out in the hall in the foyer if you want one. There are an innumerable number of Bible reading plans out there. I encourage you this year, in a call to renew your mind, to pick a different one than you did last year. Pick a different one. Now, and don't just read it. Read it and think about it. And don't just do it one day a week. Don't just do it two day a week, three day a week. Do it four days a week. Now, do you need to be legalistic about it? You need to hold yourself accountable. Can I tell you, if, if you don't write down what you eat, you're not on a diet. You're not. If you don't track your exercises, you're not on a workout routine. No, no, you're just, you're, just, you're, you're deluding yourself. If you don't track your Bible reading, you're not on a Bible reading plan. You've got to be able to hold yourself accountable. And the only way to hold yourself accountable to anything is to monitor what you do and compare it to what you wanted to do. And I'm telling you, the benefit to all of this is that this year in 2020, it's not going to be another year of January hopes that we write on pieces of paper and we forget about on February 1, if not January 10. It's a year when the Holy Spirit comes in and says, I want you to believe for something big, Patsy. Jamie, I want you to believe for something big. Tom, I want you to believe for something big. Ken, I want you to believe for something big. Jared, I want you to believe for something big. Tony, believe for something big. Believe for something big. Everybody in this room, believe for something big. Mr. and Mrs. Duffus, believe for something big. Carol, believe for something big. Believe for something big. Carrie, man. And realize that it's possible because it's born of the Spirit speaking to you. But it'll never happen unless you let God transform you by changing the way you think and renewing your mind. That's my encouragement to you. Let's pray. If you just like help with setting goals and making changes in your life, that's, that's just been a struggle for you. Would you just slip your hand up right now, right where you're at? Say, that's me, Pastor. I, I just, I've struggled with setting goals. I see these hands. I'm looking around. I see others. Great, wonderful. Father, you see the hands of my brothers and sisters, and they're just being transparent. And Father, you knew that they're probably not the only ones who've struggled with setting and keeping goals. There's a lot of us that could be raising our hands. But God, they're stepping out and asking you, Father, to help them. And I pray for them, God, that you would help them embrace this call to renew our minds, to be transformed by the Word of God. Help them, Father, to know the right reading plan and how they can keep it and when they should do it, morning, noon, or night, or, or how they can apply this to their lives. God, help them. Help them to not wait till Easter, but to embrace it today. 
That's my prayer for them. You can put your hands down with every eye closed and every head bowed. I also want to extend this invitation. I believe there's a moment in everyone's life when God wants to come in and become their Lord and Savior. When they go from just believing potentially in God to really believing that God is real, that Jesus died. He didn't just die, he died in their place. And he did it for a purpose so that they could be born again, so that they could receive God's righteousness and be reconciled to their heavenly Father. I believe every single person on this earth at some point in their life needs to be born again. And if you're in this room or watching us online and you say, I, I've, never asked, I've never asked Jesus into my heart, I've never asked him to become my Lord and my Savior, I've never been born again. This morning, I want you to know that this is your time. This is your moment. This is, your, this, is your, this is when God wants you to do this, to simply say, I don't know all the answers. I don't know all the issues, but I know that God is real, and I know that Jesus died for me, and I want him to be my Lord and Savior. And he's reaching out to you through his Holy Spirit right now, and he's saying, would you give me your life? But he's not just reaching out to you, he's reaching out to other people online and right now in this room. He's reaching out to you and he's saying, I know you believe in me and I know you've asked me to be your Lord and Savior, but you know that I know that how you're living is not right. You've, you've boxed me out of your life, either because of busyness or because of whatever. And this is your morning to renew your relationship, to invite me once again to come into your life. And if you're a person who you would say, that's me, Pastor, that's who you're talking to, either on that first call that you've never been born again, or you know that you need to renew your relationship with God with every eye closed and every head bowed, would you just slip your hand up and say, that's me, Pastor Reese, that's me, that is me. I am that person this morning, and I thank you. I thank you, God. You're watching online. I, I know you can't raise your hands, but, but I pray that you'll send us an email and just to, to you can send it to Reese B at ecdenver.org. Send it to me. I'll get it personally. Reese B with a C at ecdenver.org. Because I believe that God wants to change your destiny. And so I'm going to ask all of us, you can look at me now, to join with those online and here and just simply pray this prayer. Say, Dear Heavenly Father, I want to be saved. I want to follow you. I want to change. I want you to help me. Become my Lord and my Savior. And I ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. You know, if you prayed that prayer, we want you to know that we, we want to help you. And we've got some people who are part of our ministry team that are going to be available up here. If you are in this room and you prayed that prayer, on your chair in front of you, there is a card. We'd like to ask you to fill that out. Just give us your name, your phone number, your email address, and just tell us that, hey, I prayed that prayer for the first time or to rededicate myself and, and share it with one of the pastors or myself so that we can connect you with, with some people who will help you grow and be discipled. The ministry team will be available for you as well for prayer after service. Have a wonderful new year. Have an incredible year. and. Uh, the Broncos may not be in the playoffs, but neither are the Patriots. So God bless you all. <laughs> Go with God. <laughs>